This week, Scalex Trick. What happens when I bring a whole town together to rebuild a legendary motor racing circuit entirely out of plastic pieces? You are here to race! Come on, Aston! And who will win the race of the century? The plucky locals? What do you practice then? Every lunch and every tea break. Yeah. Or people who take it too seriously. I very much doubt they'll keep up with a scaling team. I didn't pass my driving test until 1980. But by the early 70s, I already owned several cars. And they were real exotics, capable of terrifying performance. And because I was only eight, and I didn't really know what I was doing, I crashed them all the time, horribly. Despite this, one of them survives. And here it is, my Mini Cooper. All original, still a runner, one careless owner. No real car I've ever owned was half as much fun as this one. Scalextric is still with us, but somehow, and like a burnt out motor, it has started to reek faintly of past glory. I take myself off to Surrey to meet leading Scalextric aficionado Rob Smith, hoping that I won't be led to yet another loft. Shall I dish you? Yes, please, we're going up into the loft. Ah. That's a sure sign that you are a committed and serious enthusiast of something. <laughs> yeah, we had a loft conversion to store everything. As with many men of a certain age, Rob's attic is the place where his eight-year-old self lives. <laughs> Welcome to my lair. <laughs> cars. How many cars have you got? Uh, there's about 3,000. Right from 57, right through till, well, some arrived yesterday. Really? Mm -hmm. You're a married man, aren't you? I am. Did anybody ever say, haven't you got enough scale extra now? She does say that quite often. She does say and that quite you? often. <laughs> well, no, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Rob is what's known in the trade as a scale extra nerd. Fred Francis, in the uh, late 50s, from Mini Models Limited, took a range of, of tin models that he made that were called Scalex and put an electric motor in them. And Scalex plus electric became Scalextric. And that's why nobody can pronounce it properly. Well, they all do it the wrong way around, yes. Everyone says Scalextrics. This is all marvellous, but something is missing from the converted roof space. A racetrack. There isn't one. So it's time to build one and drive scale extric cars as their inventor intended, flat out. And this leads me to a complaint. There has always been one fundamental flaw with the scale extric set. They were designed for mum and dad's pocket, not in accordance with the ambition of the eight-year-old James May. So you got your cars, you got some fences and flags and your hand controllers, but never enough track. Now, if you manage to blag some more track for your birthday, you could build one of the circuits in this book. 101 circuits for scale electric drivers. Here, for example, is Spa, and here is Brands Hatch. They are perfect miniature representations of real-life racing tracks. However, there is one circuit missing from that otherwise riveting volume. Brooklands, the first purpose-built motor racing circuit in the world. My ambition, then, is to rebuild Brooklands in Scale Extric. Not here, on the table, but at Brooklands itself. Full size. Today, it is impossible to drive a lap of Brooklands. Only about half of the circuit survives, and it's interrupted by a river, fences, roads, houses and offices. The famous clubhouse is now just a sleepy museum. These days, of course, Brooklyn's is the sort of place where people come for a cup of tea, where you might find a classic car club getting together to swap grommets. And that's all absolutely smashing. But what it really lacks now is the sense of excitement, the surge of the crowd, the cheering, the raw bellow of competition. And we can put that back. Alan Wynne, curator of the museum, sits me down on a historic bench and makes it clear just how difficult it will be to reopen Brooklands, even in scale extric. I'd never seen this aerial picture before. This is, this is the tricky bit, because it's just gone, isn't it? 
Yeah, yeah, there's nothing really left of it. But we can trace it with, if you take a, an overlay like that. That's very pleasingly old school, that, Alan, a piece of overhead projection sheet with some felt tip on it. Yeah. Anyone yeah. else would have done a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, well, <laughs> this, is, this is computer graphic um, uh, generated. No, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> So that housing estate is, well, post-war, obviously. Yep, yeah, 1970s. And that, what is that building? That's, that's Procter & Gamble, that's right on the line of the track. Right. And then this is Sony's building, um, so Hi-Fi and so forth are sold uh, just from there. I'm going to make it a basic principle of our project now that we must follow the original line of the circuit, even where it's disappeared, because otherwise we're not being true to history. So that means... Yes, we have to go down the housing estate and we will have to go through the hair gel manufacturer, but that's what it takes. Yep, and you've got um, an office building here, you've got a multi-storey car park here. Bit of a challenge, but you should be able to mm. do that. This will be the first time since 1939 that it's actually been done. It'll be the first lap since 1939? Yeah. That's quite something, isn't it? Yeah. Look at that. That is an original and completely unmolested bit of the Brooklyn's banking. It's very beautiful, very evocative. It is, in fact, this bit here, around this long sweeping curve, leading down to the start-finish straight. And it will be the work of minutes to go through that with a strimmer and lay our scale electric track all the way down here. But then we arrive at a problem here. Not the hedge, actually, but beyond the hedge is a housing estate built in 1994. So I'm off to see the local neighbourhood watch people to warn them that some people will be uh, driving cars in a rather hooligan-like manner through here. Staniland Drive was built smack on the old Brooklyn start finish straight. In fact, the edges of these houses' front lawns mark the edge of the original circuit. I know, because I was a teenager once, that driving across people's gardens doesn't generally go down that well. At least not without permission. How do you feel about it going through your garden? We're talking about the front garden here, aren't we? Not the front garden, garden, yes. Yeah, front garden, Just yeah. That's, that's fine. fine yeah. There's a very yeah. neat little gap in there. Oh, oh, you're yeah, very yeah. welcome to... Yes, and I'd be very interested to help you do that as well. You would? Yes. Why is everyone so nice around here? But, oh, <laughs> but, but, oh, see, you have to be nice to live around here. Oh, do you? Is yeah, that a rule? That's of, yeah, that's a clause. <laughs> Encouraged by the willing and compliant nature of the locals, I next decide to tackle the council. This dual carriageway cuts straight through one of the fastest parts of the course. The end of the original banking where it was cut. That's correct, yeah. It continues down there. Yes. The other side of the lawn. So in order for this to be a continuous, uninterrupted race circuit, I need to go across there with that. Yeah. Any objections? I have some slight worries about people seeing it and stopping, and I have slight worries about um, lorries scripping it up. There are so many obstacles on this so-called racing circuit that overcoming them all is a job for a dedicated expert. And the perfect man for the job, or at least the cheapest, is project manager Sim Oakley. How are you? Very good. What do you think? It's evocative, isn't it? It's a nice place. If you listen very, very carefully, you can still hear the sound of Diana Bonato Walker's Bentley reverberating through the trees. Honest. I can't. It's a lot steeper than I thought. Problem number one is the historic slope. We could this is very steep, and I can't imagine our car is going to stay on here at all. But I quite like the idea, for historical reasons, that we're up the banking as we come round here. I think you're right. <laughs> Good. So that's one decision made. Our track will be built on the flat. Problem number two will be the many fences that break up the course. Well, that's it, we can't do it. It's not going to be the world breaking track. <laughs> oh, and not only that, look. Oh, God. There's a chasm. Some of the fences are more than 14 feet high. Well, you're not going to go over that. That's 450 scale feet, for those of you with an interest in pointless arithmetic. Because obviously you can't go up like that, can you? It needs to... And then there are the water features, including a river. Ah! Can we do a Wait, jump? 
not to mention this load of old carp. If we were being true to form, we would go straight up this pond. And you'd be able to drive from up here, in fact. It would be great, because you'll see that as the cars go, there'll be little ripples. Yeah. It will be great. But I like the jeopardy of having to drive from this bridge across the pond, knowing that if you get it wrong, your car goes in the drink and is lost forever. The final obstacle confronts us in the HQ of a global personal hygiene empire, and it is the most feared of scale electric perils. We have to get up the stairs. Well, we've got to get up to the first floor. It's quite steep, but... It is quite steep. It's a good challenge. Just when it looks like things can't get any harder, something else occurs to us about our giant outdoor electric toy challenge. What happens if it rains? Um... While Sim works on that little lot, it's time for me to recruit my driving teams. I need two of 140 people each. Each controller and battery will only power a small section of track, so our race will be something of a relay. Afternoon. One team, I've decided, will be made up from die-hard, trigger-happy, Scalextric enthusiasts. Some of them are quite young and treat Scalextric as an intellectual exercise. I like going really fast um, and winning. I like getting new cars and everything. I like getting new cars and destroying them. <laughs> Do you know what I actually expected when I came here? I'll be brutally honest, I expected a load of nerdy old blokes. Going, oh, my tyres are not... Yeah, we didn't let any of them come today. We banned them today. Oh, you so have we, got yeah, them Yeah, we've got them right. hidden away in the closet, but not today. Uh, there you go, it's carnage on turn one. The children are already pretty good and have twitchy fingers. What must Thursday nights be like? That's when the adults come out. I've got a picture of Thursday night in my mind and it's a yeah. bit frightening. Uh, most spend their time with the head down, just in the car, just trying to get that split second faster to get that next position. What do you adjust on a scale electric car? Everything. You can adjust gear ratios, you can adjust tyres, you can adjust the chassis, you can adjust springs on it. Once you go to that level, they become possessed with it. Are there any fights? No. No people having tantrums or representations to the um, marshals? Yes. Oh, no, this is hopeless. I was once told that everybody who races a Sky Electrics is basically a frustrated Formula One racer. Yes, I think you're probably right. So A lot of people who drive real cars are like that. Correct. It's better that they do it in there <laughs> than out here. Yep. My other team will be made up from people who live and work around the old track. People who absorb the spirit of Brooklyn's daily. I start at the head office of the electronics company that rhymes with Boney. Right, hello everyone. Now look, the world's biggest scale electric race is going to pass, well actually over your pond. I've brought you a set. I want you to put it up, find out who the best drivers are and then I need those names, and then they're going to become part of the team. This is a large corporate organisation with allegedly <laughs> excellent administrative capabilities, but let's see, eh? Is that a figure eight, is it? Uh, yeah, figure of eight, figure of loop on one side. Do you need to have a meeting or a PowerPoint presentation or something? Or Always. You, you can just get on with it. <laughs> that's really tight. No, no, look, that's the corner. No, no, straight up there, just the corner. They could always try looking at the helpful diagram on the box lid, but perhaps that's just me being boring. There are only 12 scale electric track sections, and there isn't one that's that shape. I promise you that. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> it's wrong. I can tell it's wrong. You need the short yeah, straight yeah. there. Yeah. You like to play with electronics every day, yet you can't sell one of these. <laughs> there we go. Oh, well done, Woods. Just setting up the track has been like a corporate team-building event, and I'm worried that their attitude isn't very modern. Because we're obviously not the greatest at it. Yeah, I don't think you should have women us. drivers, actually. <laughs> you can't say that. I'm not actually that great. I was only good at knocking other people off the track, but whatever, it was good fun. We might need a few people to put the cars back on. God knows how that lot ever managed to produce something like a television.
Taking a break from driver training, I step outside to see how Sim is getting on with his low-budget solution to crossing the pond. The most significant obstacle on the track, a pond that has been dug right in the middle of the old Brooklyn circuit and which we are obliged, under our own rules, to cross with the scale electric track. And Sim here has been working late into the morning on a solution that is both elegant and, more importantly, very cheap. Pipe insulation. Polyurethane pipe insulation. Does it actually float? Uh, it will float. This is only cheap 4 mil ply. Is it waterproof? It's not waterproof. Or won't it just all swell up? It, well, if it rains, it'll swell up. If, when it's in the lake, in the pond, I should say, it should be off the surface of the water. <laughs> <laughs> it should be. How are we actually going to get it into the pond? Um... <laughs> it's V murky, Sim. It's a bit murky. Very murky. James, you can swim, can't you? Not very well, actually. OK, right, send it in. With car. Hey, I think I've just found Birkin's blower Bentley. Is that it? James, we've run out of track. I'm not <laughs> kidding. It's not a good start, is it? How can you have run out of track? You're supposed to have three miles. <laughs> I know, it's not here yet. Oh, for God's sake. It looks fantastic. It's slightly lacking in one important detail, though. <laughs> the track? Yes. Seriously, where is it? Good man. Right, stay put. It floated away when I wasn't looking. Well, you might have to try and hook it. But it's too deep. Two, one. Hang on, hang on. <laughs> you pranged, you idiot. I wasn't ready. <laughs> it does float for about three seconds. <laughs> and then? If you got somebody in a very fast boat, they could get it. How can you got so much water? That's ridiculous. Well, oh, look at that. So There's got holes, holes in, in it. it, for Pete's sake. You knew that had holes in it, didn't you? <laughs> right, I'm going home. Look at that, I can make the two jets of water play upon each other in an artistic fashion. So, what have we learned from that? Well, the bridge floats rather well, actually, but the car doesn't. If the car comes off on the bridge, it will sink in the pond and be lost forever. With the pond crossings sort of sorted, it's time to see how our toy cars will cope with the steep ramps needed to scale the fences. Rather well, as it turns out. Oh, how is he? I think we could have the makings of an Olympic sport here. Piece of cake. Oh, James! I thought it would have more legs. Do you reckon it would go vertical? Look at that. You've still got power. So, Sim's answer to the stairs at the Grooming Products HQ is actually a bit unnecessary. But it looks good. Yep. Ready? Good, yep. Inside track? Inside. Off you go. Oh, power oh, sliding. This is magnificent. Power sliding all the way up. Look at that. And down we go. I'm now confident that the scale electric track can be made to go around the old Brooklyn circuit. The bigger question now is, can the community racing team get the car around the track? I'm meeting some more volunteers back at the business park. Hello. 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 How are you? I'm very good. It's the basic figure of eight set, look. The picture of how to put it together is on the front. I'll put these together, you put the set together. As you'd expect of purveyors of educational toys, it takes this lot just two minutes to put the set together. Unfortunately, none of them has ever actually played Scale Extric before. Oh! 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 Oh!
<laughs> Boldly, I risk being patronising with a handy hint. Can I just suggest something? <laughs> you can squeeze it fully as long as you lift your finger off before you, before you get to the bends like that, you see. I managed to get away with that, though largely because they weren't listening. Will you practice, though? Yeah. Seriously, because yes, I'm... Yes, absolutely. I said I wouldn't, but I'm starting to take it quite seriously. Every lunch hour yeah. and every tea break. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I suppose it is the early learning centre. But this has got me thinking. Scale electric driving is worthy of some scientific analysis. A better understanding of how these cars behave may be the key to keeping them shiny side up. Now, scale electric cars crash all the time, and simply not crashing may be the key to winning. But what actually happens during a scale electric crash? With the help of Simon here, and his computer, and his very, very high-speed camera, we can slow down a range of typical high-speed scale electric accidents. Normally, this all happens far too quickly, but in slow motion, we can see what goes wrong and learn from it. And so can my community racers. Here he comes. First, here's what happens if you just barrel carelessly into the bend. As you can see, the rear wheel is lifting and the car is, in fact, rolling over. This is strangely fascinating, because it's in a groove. Exactly. So I try a slightly more intelligent cornering technique. Turning in. Putting a bit of power on there. And this one, the back comes out. Oh, uh, yeah. Without wishing to sound pretentious, I put the power down slightly later in the bend on the second one. So obviously, putting the power down too early tips it as well. Makes it roll in the first yeah. instance, and then... So that would suggest slow into the bends is a good technique. And fast out. So one, like that with your finger, could be enough to save the day. What this proves, possibly, is that driving a scale electric car is more like driving a real car than I thought. Brake before the bend, accelerate through it. So a bit of cornering practice in a real car will pay dividends when piloting a scale model with one finger. Probably. This is the Mercedes-Benz test track, which is inside the old Brooklyn circuit. We're taking six of our community drivers, people who are going to be tackling particularly difficult parts of the track, and sending them here for a bit of driver training. Then we'll get them to do the same thing in Scale Extract. Clear? Good. Tom, from Boney, is convinced by my thinking on this. I'm definitely looking forward to today, although Scale Extract's not my strongest point at the moment. I hope that will get better over the course of the day. But Clara reveals something we didn't know about her. I'm very scared. I only passed my test about two weeks ago and I haven't been driving since, so I haven't driven since my tests. Driving tips from the instructors come thick and fast. And we'll release the parking brake. It's just the lever forward of your right knee. That's it, that didn't come up all the way. That's perfect. Yeah. That's it. And straight on, don't worry, that's oh good. <laughs> and Tom isn't doing brilliantly either. Right, left, left, off gas. Back on, back on and steer left. While the locals seek an extra 10% out on the track, I'm back with Sim, seeing if I can get an extra 10% out of the car. And for this, we're using a speed gun, like the police use. It's the first time anything like this has been used for something constructive. You ready? Yep. Go. Thank you. 13 miles an hour. But there's something else. You see, scale electric cars these days are fitted with magnets, which help keep them stuck down to the track. They're a sort of magnetic downforce, but like the aerodynamic type, it comes at a penalty. It must increase drag, because in physics, as I'm sure you know, you don't get anything for nothing. So let's see how much difference it makes if we take that out. Simmy? Yep. Can you take the magnet out and then send it down again? Yep. Go. 13 miles an hour was the mean speed with magnets. Fourteen miles an hour. So let's call it one mile an hour faster, which means over a distance of two point eight miles, the car without the magnets would be 
well, faster. Or would it? Now, this is the simplest scale electric circuit you can have. It's just a circle, and I have it rigged up to a train set controller with a knob so I can control the power very accurately. Here is our 911 with no magnets. Put it on the inside track, set it going. That's power number one, two, three, four, five, six. Right at six, it's just starting to come off. Seven, there you go. Number seven on the dial is the fastest it can corner. Now, we'll take our 911 with the magnets. Same track. There it is up to seven already. Eight, nine, 10. That doesn't come off until I get it to 11. So Eight, what you might gain nine, on the straights by removing ten. the magnets, you'd lose on the bends. And bends are actually where races are won. The simple fact is that this is about driving skill, nothing more. Back at the test track, my volunteers are improving enormously. As soon as the car strikes, I'm like... OK, well done. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Nearly. That's it, keep steering. That's it. <laughs> How did that feel? Oh my god. <laughs> now let's see how they do on a scale electric version of the same test track. So, consistent driving and good time, please. Go. Incredibly, it has made a difference. Now all they need to do is pass on this newfound knowledge to the other 136 members of the Brooklyn's team. Easy. The big day. In just six hours' time, the two teams will join in mortal motorsport combat, and Brooklyn's will once more resonate to the sound of real racing, although it might be a bit tinny. Can you get yourself over to the lawn, please? That'd be fine. Thank you. Hundreds of locals have turned up to help lay this record-breaking two and three-quarter mile track. Men, women, for 70 years, people have come here merely to run their fingers through the dust of motorsport history. But today, today is different because you are here to race. Whether you win or you lose, you people today here are guaranteed an entry in that great unfinished book that is the history of motor racing at Brooklands. Make it a proud and bold one. Carry on. Thank you. Everyone's building the section of track that's nearest to their home or office. They'll also be responsible for driving the team car round that part of the course. If you look at the track today, I mean, it's overgrown. I mean, it's weeds and I mean, you can see the concrete underneath it, but uh, to stick a track down on it and to have kids playing on it who've never even heard of Brooklyn's, I think is, is brilliant, yeah, it's good. I think the big concern here is how uneven this is. Sky Electric Track don't like that, and we got nearly a mile just to lie here. Clara and the babes from Babywear are seeing the old concrete road that runs past their shop in a new and more meaningful light. I guess it's kind of a historic event because at least then they're doing more racing rather than just leaving it to get overgrown, overgrown. with weeds. <laughs> OK, you know where you are on the map here. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, this is your section. But Tom and his fellow electronics whiz kids are getting nervous. Their section is full of hazards. That is tricky. Look, we've got to do... You've got to control the car around a, a, a full circuit loop, 180, back again, and then round the roundabout again. Let's cross our fingers. <laughs> The experts are smelling blood. I'm a Scalectric enthusiast. Um, since I was a child, we know the product and we know the skills required to race miniature cars. I very much doubt 
they'll keep up with the Scalitri team. To the younger volunteers, Sim's achievements with mild steel and sticky tape are clearly an inspiration. When it goes through the hole, I think it will fall off. No, Remy, it won't fall off. Not in our section. Our section won't fall but off. In their section, yeah. Yeah, in their section. <laughs> Over at the dual carriageway, Sim is ready to reveal the sort of thinking that once got him a job on Scrap Heap Challenge, a removable section of track that means the road won't have to be closed all day. Uh, what we're doing here, we've got this uh, 12 metre long section which we're going to lay the track on, and then when the time comes, volunteers are going to walk out into the middle of the road when the traffic is stopped, lay it down in the middle of the road, the cars will go across it, they'll pick it up and take it away. And we've had a bit of luck with another road. Sim has found a storm culvert, which means we might be able to go under it rather than across it. You not smell that? Ah! What is it? Oh, God, there's a dead fox in it. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to tell you about oh, that. Oh, that's rank. <laughs> right. Have you got some sort of really fine model makers two mil ply so it can bend into a nice progressive curve? Yes. Well, that's well, what we'll do then. I've got some four mil cheap stuff. <laughs> Coming in, James. Release. Almost genius. That's about right. That's lovely. Send the car down. Ready? Yep. Well, did you have to do... Oh, God. <laughs> right, that works. Over at the pond, Tom and his team are still struggling to get the floating bridge to work. I think the issue is going to be raising this up because otherwise we're going to have such an angle that the car's going to fly off into the water. Yeah, we're going to lose it in the lake. At the 14 foot fence, Sim reveals yet again his mastery of mild steel bar stock. That's, That's, That's good. That's better. Marvellous. Yeah. That looks very nice. After just two hours, three quarters of the track and some cardboard are already in place. Oh, somebody's going to go off there and that's going to take a lot of retrieving, isn't it? Yeah. Are they nettles? Us, we thought you'd give us a hand with that one. I'm going to be over there. <laughs> no, over there. <laughs> and we've even found a way of getting across the river by turning a sewage pipe into part of the Brooklyn's banking. And hopefully, as they keep feeding it from this end, it will eventually emerge at the other end. There's a massive kink beyond you. At the other end there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's, we just got to put it onto this side of the pipe. OK. Here, make sure it's on this side. Make sure you don't want a chicane in the middle. You're it's bloody positive. Everything's <laughs> <laughs> done. You push these bits together. We've done lots of it. Over at the housing estate, Skelex Trick is bringing people together in the community. Any excuse for a street party down here, but it's quite nice to actually join that end of the street with this end of the street, cos uh, that doesn't normally happen an awful lot, but, um, yeah, it's great. Are you coming to help build the track? <laughs> Come on, then, cos you Come get to on. play with it once it's built. Cos it's going over your garden, isn't it? Yeah. Should we go and build our track, boys? Yeah. 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 But inevitably, a problem that always emerges when trying to go around the piano or the sideboard also reveals itself here, a hundred times over. This is a problem we're going to have a lot because the um, sections of track are made, say, along Sandland Drive, along the banking, that's fine. But when you come to join them up, you end up needing an odd piece, like a quarter curve or a short straight. Now, we could join this up here, but because the track goes left and then right, we're simply going to recreate that problem over there. So this has turned into a massive geometric headache. But should we give it a go anyway? Yep. yep. Right, so you need to go that way a bit. James has moved the problem <laughs> 20 feet to the right. <laughs> now we need to move, all the track needs to come this way, so we need everyone to grab hold of bits of track and that's going to extend all the way down. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. There you go. Another unforeseen problem is idiots learning to drive real cars. 
the driving um, school have driven over the track that we laid this morning at half past six and, and damaged it. So we've got to replace it. That was really hard work. And that was a really lot of money. As the volunteers do a final pass of the track, I head off to the clubhouse to meet former racing driver and TV presenter Tiff Dell, who has offered to be my roving reporter at this historic event. Tiff, tell us what it means to you. So much, really, James. I mean, my, my father was here as a spectator watching the last ever Brooklands race, what, just over 70 years ago. Mm. He, he used to do auto tests here. This was where my own love of motorsport was born. And did you ever imagine you'd see another race here? No, this is what's so exciting. Actually, a race at Brooklands again after all those years just means so much. Mm. You'll be telling us what happens. I won't be able to see, of course. From Do you see any, right. any potential hazards ahead of me that I should be concentrating on? Any areas of danger? I think the areas of interest will be the high fence, the pond, the spiral ascent of doom. I don't remember a spiral ascent of doom. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't, but then there wasn't the headquarters of a popular soap distributor ah, in the middle of the track. Right. Is there any time limits on this event? Well, we've got to finish it before it gets dark, because it's not lit. Good. But back on the track, the glorious weekend weather has caused a peculiar problem. We laid the track earlier in the morning when there was nice cloud cover. The sun's come out, the track itself has got very hot, and along the length we've now got bumps like this occurring. Um, this is something we're going to have to look at and hopefully take sections out to make them right, to bring this back down to level. There's not much else I can say. The volunteers now need to check the full two and three quarter miles of track to get rid of any other expansion hazards. Finally, after just six hours of pushing plastic pieces together, the Brooklyn circuit is linked up for the first time since 1939. Now the two teams are under starter's orders and change into their racewear. The scale extric enthusiasts are in silver. I actually hold world record for 24 hour slot car racing over in America, so you could say I'm well practiced. And the 140 terrified locals are in maroon. I feel really nervous and excited at the same time. I'm just going to speed along and beat him. Them. Excited nervous. and nervous. Because it's probably going to crash, because we can't see the corners. May the best man team win, yes, and the same. <laughs> Well, it's an absolutely glorious day here at Brooklands for the first motor race around the entire circuit for just over 70 years. The sun is blazing out of a perfect blue sky, adding to the white heat of competition that is being experienced down here at track level on the historic members' banking. The cars are in position on the start line. Some minor final adjustments and preparations are being made by the teams. The crowd are in very good cheer. <laughs> and the tension and excitement here are positively palpable. I'm going to hand over now to our roving reporter, Tiff Nidell. Tiff, can you hear me? What's happening where you are? Well, I'm sitting at the first real big hazard, the Beecher's Brook, if you like, of the course, where the cars come zooming through this car park, then come over this huge high fence. Whether they stay on the track or not remains to be seen. And we're using 1920s technology to cover the race today. We have a photograph of the Brooklyn circuit in its heyday when it was complete. Our checkpoints and significant obstacles are marked. Uh, my glamorous assistant, Helen, here will be moving the two model cars around in response to information coming in through her ear so I know how the race is going. This is surely going to be the greatest motor race I've never seen. Finally, the cars are ready to go. A maroon Aston Martin for the locals, a silver McLaren Mercedes for the scale extreme nerds. The batteries are attached and the track goes live. It's time to race the biggest scale extreme circuit the world has ever seen, a record-breaking 2.75 miles, if it works. Fantastic!
fantastic. Come on, Aston. <laughs> Amazingly, the Brooklyn's locals soon begin to draw ahead. That is spectacular. The Aston has streaked into the lead, but for how long? Who knows? The red mist of motor racing has descended on the community team. As the car enters each controller's section, the takeover is near seamless. They give it the berries across the bridge and their lead increases. The Scalextric experts have stalled on a straight bit and it's not clear why. Turns out to be nothing more than a lump of historic cack on the pickups. Right through your legs. <laughs> Tip, the news is that the McLaren Mercedes is on the move again and approaching the river crossing. The Scalextric geeks use all their skill to try and close the gap. Yeah! And they're in luck, because further down the course, the Brooklyn's car suddenly comes off the track. And when they put it back on, it's dead. Hopefully that way will not catch up with us. The experts are making up ground, but then suddenly one of their team goes weak and helps the locals out. Yeah. Keith, what's wrong with it? I think it's because of the dirt and dust on the track that's uh, caused a problem. The Brooklyn's team mishap could cost them dear. The nerds are closing the gap fast. Come on! Yes, 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 go, 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 go! go. 30 feet between the cars, apparently, Tiff. A quarter of the way round the track and the Scalextric experts finally pass the Brooklyn's car. But the Brooklyn's team put their fingers down and regain the lead. But well, they're swapping places all the way along the railway straight. Then the Scalextric team overtake once again. James, 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 the experts car very fast, coming up to the big fence now. It's the silver Mercedes in the lead coming over the big, yeah, and over it, and cleared it. It's rearing off now towards the Byfleet banking with a very healthy lead as the Brooklyn Zaffy is coming over the top of the big fence right now. Here it comes, up the ramp. Keep going, keep going. No, it's stopped. The driver is up, it's edging, it's edging it. For, it's over the top, it's over the top, over the top. The Brooklyn's Aston has cleared the big fence. Aston has cleared the high fence. That is 100 yards behind the Mercedes. We're just running to the end of the car park. There's one more high fence, James, they have to clear. And yes, the Aston's just got out. They're now both out of the car park. Both cars are on the by fleet banking. The, uh, the St John's Ambulance have reported that both cars are in Section 7 and approaching the road crossing. It's the most reliable piece of information we've had relayed to us all day, which suggests this is a very good place to have a heart attack or a baby. The cars are now halfway round the track and the road has been closed so Sim's electric flyover can swing into action. The scale electric experts speed across the road without a problem. But Sim's mobile track section loses power when the Brooklyn's team is halfway across. I'm afraid this is terrible news. It's stuck on the road. If it doesn't move when the road is reopened, it will be flattened. <laughs> A small section of track has to be replaced before they can speed on their way. Let's go. The Brooklyn's team draws extra power from the cheering crowd. They don't just catch up, they storm into the lead. Oh, it's absolutely, it's going faster than I can run at the moment. The Brooklyn's Aston is nearing the end of the by fleet banking. I'm a bit worried the children might run onto the track. I'm running out of breath. It's going at a fantastic speed. The experts car is way back in the distance now, 400, 500 yards behind as the Brooklyn Sasson heads towards the next crossing. The cars are now three quarters of the way round the course, but they still face some of the most difficult obstacles. Can the Brooklyn's team maintain their position? This is absolutely gripping everybody. Tiffany Dell is now heading for a Pims and a sausage from a barbecue on Sandaland Drive. He can hardly contain himself. What's happening, Tiff? Well, it's getting very tense down here at Sandaland Drive. Here are the drivers ready. How do you know when your car is going to appear? Um, we hear screaming and shouting. We believe you're in the lead, but it's neck and neck. Yeah, apparently. 
Definitely. There is some screaming and shouting coming. The Brooklyn's team are still in the lead as they take Sims' off-cut sewage pipe through the hedge at full chat. Come on, Brooklyn. And there it is. Oh, they're through. Yes. Oh, it's off again. It keeps on crashing. She's going too fast. James, I have the leaders. I have the leaders. And it is the red. The Brooklyn's Aston Martin is soaring up Stanleyland Drive. We haven't even seen the Mercedes yet. But the Aston Martin is absolutely roaring. Yes, the Brooklyn's Aston is going up the drive. It's miles ahead. It's going through the garden. Fantastic driving there from the local residents of the 90s built housing estate. The scale electric experts are in hot pursuit and threatening to regain the lead. But the Brooklyn's team are keeping a committed collective finger on the trigger. They may have picked up a leaf from Staniland Drive, but they make short work of Dead Fox Tunnel. But brilliant driving from the experts is closing the gap, and they roar past the corpse of Basil Brush just seconds later. Well, James, just in the van now, go from Staniland Drive over to the, to the lake to see if the Aston Martin can get across this next big obstacle. It's now up to Tom and his team to get the car safely across Silicon Pond. And there is the Brooklyn's Aston Martin. No, it's stopped in the middle of the pond, James. We are at the pond, and the Aston Martin has stopped right in the middle of the pond. Oh, no, the Brooklyn's Aston Martin is halfway across the pond. It hasn't fallen in the pond, but it's come out of its slot. <laughs> Meanwhile, the nerds are getting ever closer. It's a critical point in the race. The plywood and pipe insulation bridge could be the point where Brooklyn's lose the lead. Come on, get in the water, get in the water! Off you go. launch the boat! The team are manning the rubber boat to row out and put it back in position. Well done! The movement of the water literally made the car go again. Heroic from the Brooklyn's people, heroic stuff! This is people power, people power! guiding the Aston Martin forward. Still, the experts rein in the maroon Aston Martin of local hope, while the Brooklyn's team drive hard towards the final obstacle, the spiral ascent of doom up to the executive floor of the soap dispenser. It's going up the spiral, James. It's going up the spiral. Fantastic, I'm seeing it. It is brilliant. It's spiralling upwards. Go, Brooklyn's, go! Go, Brooklyn's! It's cleared the spiral. The scale extra experts are just seconds behind. As they enter the shampoo spiral, it's anybody's race. <laughs> but then, with less than a quarter of a mile to go, everything goes strangely quiet. <laughs> Tiff, the action is very unclear from this end. I'm not sure what's happening. Can you inform me? Tiff's radio battery has run out. All I know is that the cars were neck and neck. Any reports? And all I can do is wait and see which one comes round the final corner in the lead. At last, a lone car appears on the home stretch. And I can hardly believe it. It's the Aston. Here it comes, everybody. It's a victory for the community. It's a world record! <laughs> Record-breaking community racing groups, Aston Martin DB9. Fantastic. So glad we actually did it and it actually went all the way round. Any crashes? No. Came off once. Well, that's okay. <laughs> and moments later, the nerds also complete the longest scale electric track the world has ever seen. Hoves into view and streaks down the finishing straight. Looking gorgeous here. Fantastic.
Superb! It even has bits of undergrowth stuck in it. Do we have a world record? You do have a world record. Yes. You have indeed smashed the previous world record by something like 1.4 miles. It is officially a Guinness world record. Well done. Thank you very much. Thanks for your help. <laughs> Fantastic work. The old banking can rest easy tonight. For 70 years, it was believed that Brooklands had seen its last race. But a few hundred people, thousands of pieces of track and two very small toy cars have shown that the spirit of Brooklands is alive and well. And it was that spirit that drove the locals to victory. They were never going to lose.